Today we have three panelists. John helped the meeting set up and all the registrations. So he will also record the lecture and share the recordings with all of you after the lecture. So now I would like to introduce our webinar moderator, Dr. Nadia Lemmon. Dr. Lemmon is a research assistant professor in the Department of Comparative Pathobiology at Purdue. She also manages the Purdue side of the collaborative core for cancer bioinformatics, which is a joint core for cancer researchers at Purdue and Indiana University. She has a background in biochemistry, molecular biology, computational biology, and her research interests include single cell data analysis and data integration. With that, I will hand it over to Nadia. Hi, welcome, we're glad you're here. So just a few housekeeping notes. Your microphone will remain muted through the duration of the seminar. And if you have any questions to ask Dr. Kraft, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then we will take questions after the hour lecture. Now I'll hand it back over to Min. Thanks, Nadia. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Kraft from Howard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Kraft is Professor of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and Director of the Program in Genetic Epidemiology and Statistical Genetics. His research concentrates on the design and analysis of genetic association studies with particular emphasis on cancer. Over the past 15 years, he has participated in many international consortia studying genetics and environmental exposures related to cancer risk. His methodological work focuses on efficient analysis of the gene by environment interactions and building risk prediction models using high dimensional genetic data. Since 2013, he has co-chaired the AACR's Integrity Molecular Epidemiology Workshop. And Dr. Kraft is currently president-elect of the International Genetic Epidemiology Society. Today, he will present on using polygenic risk scores to inform cancer screening. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kraft. Great. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. I'm sorry we can't be in person. Um, I would have enjoyed that, but uh, hopefully during the Q&A, we still get some interactions going on. Um, I also noticed that uh, I forgot to update my bio. I'm actually now the president of the International Genetic Epi Society. Uh, we will be hosting our uh, meeting in two weeks, July 2nd through 4th. Um, if you haven't, if you're interested and you'd like to attend, um, you can find us at igus.memberclicks.net or just search International Genetic Epidemiology Society. Registration for the meeting is totally free. Um, we got a, a panel of great talks. We're hoping to put together a late breaking COVID session. Um, it should be really great. So if, if you can make it, I encourage you to attend. Um, with that said, um, I'm going to pull up my talk. Mm -hmm. And play from the start. Excellent. Um, okay, so today I'll be talking about polygenic risk scores with a main focus on using polygenic risk scores to help inform breast cancer screening. Um, I think a lot about breast cancer epidemiology a lot. And since uh, we've been able to identify so many um, thermal line genetic variants that are associated with breast cancer, um, uh, it leads to the natural question of what can you, how can you use those to impact uh, health now? So long term, the sort of long game is that by identifying these genetic associations, we can understand something about the biology of the particular loci that are associated with breast cancer risk. Um, but sort of immediately, we might be able to use these to help inform uh, clinical practice. Uh, and I'm going to try and highlight that this is not just restricted to breast cancer or even cancer generally. There are other potential applications for these, uh, this technology. Um, and there are some times when you can apply it and it actually may not be the most useful. So I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about how you can make that call. So first, I'm going to introduce what polygenic risk scores are uh, and why we'd be interested in them. I'm going to talk through some details in terms of training and validating them, uh, talk about a particular challenge in validation, which is uh, evaluating performance across folks of different ancestries, um, and then talk about, okay, 
now we have a polygenic risk score. We think it works. We know how it works in this population. Is it actually useful? Can we use that to sort of change clinical decision making? Uh, and if the answer to that is yes, I'll close with some thoughts on how we might actually move these into the clinic, what we're going to need to do. Okay. So, um, you know, actually, although you could sort of start from the, I have a, you know, I've done a genome-wide association study and I want to build a polygenic risk score, I want to take a step back and say sort of like, what's the sort of clinical or public health question that we're trying to solve? Um, and, you know, for me, when I think, when I approach this, I'm often thinking about screening, because we know screening for cancer can save lives. If you can catch some cancers early, you can treat them, you can, um, if you find people who are at high risk, you can give them chemo preventive agents. Um, but who to screen, how often, and using what, what technology is often controversial. Um, so for example, in breast cancer, we've known for a long time that women with a, a, a large number of first degree of, of close relatives who have breast cancer may harbor these high penetrance mutations like BRCA1 or BRCA2. Um, or counsel to go get testing. If they turn out to be carriers, then they can have uh, exceedingly high lifetime risk of breast cancer and can opt for either intensive screening or um, even uh, prophylactic mastectomy. So this was uh, something that Angelina Jolie uh, wrote about um, seven years ago uh, when, she was, when she found out that she was a carrier of a BRCA1 mutation. At the same time, there are plenty of women who are walking around who don't have a, a first degree family relative, but still might be at higher risk um, because we haven't looked at their genetic data. You know, there may be germline mutations or uh, polymorphisms that are predisposing them to high risk, but we just don't know it. So if we knew that, would that actually change how we go about uh, making recommendations for screening? Like you should start at age 40. Um, no, you're fine starting at age 50. Um, you should come back every other year, you should get an MRI. So those are all the kinds of decisions that could be made where actually knowing something about your lifetime risk of breast cancer could help make those decisions. Um, right, so that's the setup. Now, you know, for the last um, 20 years, um, as I mentioned, we've had um, uh, ways of testing for high penetrance genes, BRCA1, BRCA2, and now there's a, a broader range of panel genes, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Um, we've also been able to assess risk using sort of questionnaire risk factor data. Um, so there's a lot of uh, hormonal exposure information that will inform somewhat on your lifetime risk. Um, uh, so the challenge with the BRCA1, BRCA2 testing is that really affects a small number of women in the general population. Um, so the women who learn that information, it's incredibly useful um, and can have a high impact in terms of their decision making. Uh, on the other hand, sort of everybody, you can ask them about everybody, you know, most women have, have a first period, you can ask them when they had that, how many kids did you have, all those things. Um, so you can sort of calculate these risk estimates for everybody in the population, but their association with breast cancer is, is relatively modest. You don't get these very, very high lifetime risks based on your questionnaire risk factors. Um, so since uh, 2006, um, uh, we've done a lot of genome-wide association studies of uh, breast cancer and other phenotypes, of course. And we've identified many loci, many alleles that, have, um, that are common in the population, um, but have individually modest associations. Um, so this is a quick summary of the latest um, breast cancer uh, genome-wide association study that was published in 2017. Um, so uh, we identified uh, over 160 loci that were associated with risk of breast cancer at this very stringent genome-wide significance level. So these are variants that when you test they're associated with breast cancer risk, the p-value is below 5 times 10 to the minus 8. Now that's a great uh, threshold for discovery, um, but it may not be a great threshold for building risk prediction models. And I'll come back to an illustration of that in a second. Um, but why do we wanna use that threshold for discovery is we wanna be very stringent. We wanna make sure we're gonna weed out as many false positives as possible. So the things that pass that threshold are really, really truly associated with breast cancer, hopefully not just because of some bias in our design, but really the, you know, they're replicable. You can go out to a new study, a new population and see the association. And the reason we do that is because following up these low size is incredibly expensive. So if the idea is we want to target a locus and now learn something about the biology, so we're going to 
do some CRISPR experiments or we're going to design a mouse model. Like those are expensive, painstaking, long-term uh, uh, investments of uh, money and postdoc time. Uh, and if they don't pan out, then it's a it's a potential loss. If there's like a high probability that this is a false positive, we don't want to chase a lot of throw a lot of money and time at it. Um, but like I was saying, if if we're not interested in really saying this locus is 100% for sure associated with breast cancer risk, we might still be able to use it in terms of building a risk model. So by restricting ourselves to these um, extremely significant. Um, loci where we're being really stringent about having a low probability of false positives, um, we may be leaving information on the table. Um, and so I just have a couple of uh, slides here, a sort of cartoon example of that. Um, this is a simulated genome-wide association study um, where I've uh, simulated 100 true causal loci. You can see there, they're not super rare, not super common, minor low frequency of 10%. Have an odds ratio of 1.04, so you know, really kind of small-ish uh, association individually. Um, and if you do a sort of small genome-wide association study, a thousand cases, a thousand controls, sort of like the first studies in cancer that we published, um, you can see that well, first of all, nothing reaches that magic threshold of five times ten to the minus eighth. And the actual true causal loci, their association statistics don't even seem to be sort of getting off the starting line. Like the sample size is so small that we don't we have we have very very little power, so it's hard actually really to differentiate true signal from noise. Um, oops, but of course as you uh, improve uh, your sample size, as you, your sample size gets bigger, the power gets a little greater, so things are starting to inch off of the the starting line there. Fifty thousand cases. Well, now we have something that's genome-wide significant. Uh, but you can start to see that there are more sort of red dots here in this middle area. And if you go to 100,000 cases, well, now we have something like 40 genome-wide significant uh, uh, loci. Um, but you also have all these red dots here in the middle. Um, uh, and they're sort of the red dots are overwhelming the gray dots here in the middle, which suggests that if you included variants that had an association that weren't, they didn't quite reach that five times 10 to the minus eighth level, but maybe they reached a you know, one times 10 to the minus fourth, if you include all those in a risk prediction model, you'd actually be including more signal than noise. So we're allowed to sort of loosen our threshold a little bit uh, in order to pick up some of that signal. So that's sort of the idea behind these polygenic uh, 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 risk models is that they're, they're including more and more loci uh, in a statistically clever fashion uh, to try and leverage that information that's, that's, that's in there um, uh, below this five times 10 to the minus eight threshold. And these risk scores actually have a very simple form. They're just a linear combination of genotype where you're counting up the number of alleles. Uh, you have some weight for each genotype. Um, if you're looking at a binary phenotype, this is usually a, um, a log odds ratio or a log hazards ratio. Um, and then you just sum them up and that's what gives you a p polygenic risk score for each individual. Um, so easy to write down. Um, but there's a lot of complicated steps that go into to actually calculating this thing. Um, first, you have to decide which variants are you going to include. Um, so you could do, again, something simple and like say, I'll take everything that's um, below some significance threshold, uh, and then I'll prune them to make sure they're independent. They're not strongly correlated with each other so that each locus is sort of picking up one variant at each one, at each, there's one SNP at each locus. Um, or you could just dump everything in the whole genome in there and uh, apply some multivariable regression approach that would allow for accounting for correlation among variants and allow you to include everything, uh, but sort of downweight things that are maybe not that strongly associated. So these are all decisions that you have to make. Um, and those are sort of the key steps that go into building these things. Which variants go in there and then how am I gonna, going to weight them? So this is just a reminder um, that uh, it's not just breast cancer, uh, and it's not just cancer generally, uh, but there are, you can build these polygenic risk scores for basically any phenotype where you have a large um, genome-wide association study uh, available. Um, uh, but the thing that I wanted to highlight here, a couple of things I want to highlight first, not only can we build polygenic risk scores for these traits, um, but these are all things where that risk might have a potential clinical utility. 
Um, so for coronary artery, artery disease, we're already using sort of risk, estimated 10-year risk as a, um, as a guide to whether you should be on statins or not. So if a polygenic risk score helps, helps estimate your 10-year risk, then there's sort of an immediate potential use in the clinic for that. Um, for prostate cancer, um, so again, just like with breast cancer, you could use that to tailor um, you know, 10-year or lifetime risks and, ide and identify people who would benefit from uh, PSA testing uh, at earlier ages or later ages or more often or not. Um, and actually with prostate, with prostate cancer, you can do something else that's cool, which is you can calibrate PSA tests because you can sort of identify what's your baseline PSA level based on your genetics. Um, so there are some people walking around who just have a high PSA level, but not because there's latent tumor or early, uh, uh, you know, sort of early tumor precursors in their prostate, but because that's just the way they roll, like that's the way their, their genetic work out. So you can sort of account for that when you, when you, when you take a PSA um, test on them. Uh, it's a, so the other point I wanted to highlight here is that for all of these traits, um, the polygenic risk score improves prediction models after you've included traditional risk factors. So there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm about polygenic risk score, um, but on some level, I think we should be clear that we're not necessarily saying this will will throw out all the risk models we've been using and only use polygenic risk scores. Um, that typically it makes sense to put all that stuff together. Um, and so for breast cancer, you can put together the questionnaire risk factors, the high penetrance mutations, mammography, um, and, and polygenic risk score. Putting those all together in a model is going to give you a lot more information. Uh, and it turns out that the polygenic risk score improves on top of all that other stuff. So it's not like, well, once I measure mammography, then the polygenic risk score goes away because all the effects of the genetics are mediated through mammography or BMI or um, uh, age of menarche. Um, that could be true, but empirically, it's just not. So all these things are sort of adding uh, a decent amount of information to the risk prediction model um, for all of these traits that I've mentioned. Okay, so now I'm gonna walk through some steps on uh, how you go about training uh, a polygenic risk score. Uh, and this is my sort of general cartoon um, because there's lots of ways you could do this. Um, but basically you have a data set where you're gonna train uh, the polygenic risk score. I'm gonna call that data set A. Uh, and then we have some model fitting procedure. It could be, like I mentioned before, take all the SNPs that are significant below some p-value threshold and then prune them so that they're independent. Um, or it could be fitting um, a ridge regression or elastic net, or you could dump them into some multi-layer uh, neural network. Like you're, this, is, this is only limited by our imagination here in the middle. Um, but the idea is at the other end, out comes some model where you could plug in genotypes and come up with a prediction. This is my expected Y. This is my expected probability of being diagnosed with breast cancer in the next five years. Um, the thing I wanted to emphasize here is that this model, this function of our inputs genotypes, is dependent on the training data set. So that's why it's Y sub A. So different training data set, same model fitting procedure, different model comes out, um, which is potentially disconcerting, but the hope is, is that we've, we have a large enough training data set and we've chosen our model fitting procedure cleverly enough that there's that the variability in this model that comes out from data set to data set is low enough uh, that our model will work in a new setting. Um, so, uh, right, so one, thing that you might do, like I mentioned, is just do a simple, a simple you could do a multivariable regression when you're throwing in all the SNPs in a genome-wide association study that, that can kind of crash. So you have to do something like this pruning and thresholding or some sort of penalized regression to do that. Um, um, so to, to fit these things, there's a number of steps that you have to take. Um, Given some hyperparameter like a penalty, you need to estimate the parameters from the model. So the hyperparameters could be a penalty from a ridge regression or that magic p-value threshold if you're doing a prudent threshold approach. Um, uh, you need to figure out which of those hyperparameters is going to perform best. 
um, because different p-value thresholds might be better or different more, more or less stringent um, penalties may give you a better fitting model. Um, and then importantly, you need to get an honest estimate of the model's internal and external performance. So by internal performance, I'm thinking you, you take a new sample in the same population where you drew your data set A. So typically one of the biggest factors that goes into this data set A for genome wide association studies is ancestry. We have a big European, like US-based European ancestry genome wide association study you want to make sure that that's going to work again in a new sample of US European ancestry individuals. So that would be internal um, uh, uh, accuracy. And then you want external performance as well, which is well, what if I went to like people from Europe, from Central Europe? They're still of European ancestry, but they're not from the US. Does our model work? Oh, good. That's good. Now let's take it a step further. What about folks from uh, Latin America? Does it work? or what if our folks from East Asia or Africa? So that's gonna be the external validity part. So all of, both of those things are important to check. And for, uh, so one of the ways that this can, so I've highlighted the sort of no cheating, no peaking, uh, is uh, you wanna be careful that you're not sort of evaluating the model in the same data set where you framed it, um, because we have incredibly rich data, like. 20 million SNPs from a genome-wide association study, right? So it's really easy to find a model that's going to be perfect in your training data set. Um, so this is just an illustration of that that we published uh, almost 10 years ago, um, where we um, applied this pruning and thresholding approach to a breast cancer data set um, and evaluated the performance either in the training data set, that's the dashed line. So in the same thousand cases and thousand controls where we built the model, we then asked how good are we doing at separating cases from controls? Uh, and it turns out pretty damn good once you had about 500 SNPs in the model, the discrimination was the AUC was basically one, which meant cases and controls totally separated. PRS cases over here, PRS controls way over there. Um, beautiful. Um, of course, if you take that model into a new data set, um, it's going to tank because uh, we've fit basically noise that was in our original GWAS. So we, we want to make sure that um, the, the models we fit are actually going to generalize. Uh, and there's a bunch of ways to do that. Uh, one way would make sure would be to set aside part of your data to make sure that um, uh, to serve as a, as a testing data set to see how well you're really doing. Um, the other would be something like cross validation, which is what we did here. Um, so this cross-validation estimate of the discrimination is a much better estimate of how it's going to do it in, in a new data set. Um, and here you can see that this is a drastic difference between test data set error and uh, the cross-validated estimate of, sorry, this is training data set error, and this is the cross-validated estimate of the test data set error. Um, so to make that a little more concrete, I want to walk through um, sort of how we did this uh, in developing uh, a polygenic risk score for breast cancer. Um, this is this came out last spring. Um, so uh, we actually were in the position to uh, we had a we had the luxury of actually being able to set aside a validation data set. Um, so we had um, a large number of cases and controls. So we used uh, eighty five thousand cases and sixty eight thousand controls to develop the model to fit a bunch of different candidate models. And then we had a validation data set where we would sort of evaluate how those models did and choose the best model from there. And as you'll see in a second, we actually had a third set of data which we could use to actually evaluate our best, uh, our best, data, uh, our best model. Uh, right, so here we go. Here's the test data set. So we actually had two independent test data sets. Um, one was another set of cases and controls um, from this large case control consortium. And the other was the UK Biobank. Um, so in terms of how do we go about uh, developing uh, the model, we actually uh, did, we fit a bunch of models using each of two strategies. The first was a variant of this prune and threshold strategy where you find loci using this, uh, just simply is the p-value below some threshold. And then at each locus, you do, you do, do some sort of uh, stepwise regression to, to keep, to keep SNPs that are in basically statistically independently contributing to the risk. Um, and the, the hyperparameter here is, to, is this threshold p-value. So 
the bigger that p-value, the sort of the more SNPs you're including in your model. And the other approach was uh, to, uh, to implement a lasso, which is a form of penalized regression. Um, and here we varied the penalty. So bigger penalty, fewer SNPs, smaller penalty, more SNPs. Um, this is just uh, um, uh, a quick summary of uh, sort of the best models that we ended up finding. Um, and I think the main thing I want to highlight here um, is uh, the fact that because we had this prospective test set, um, we could compare the fit of our best model, um, which we here we were assuming was, would have a per standard deviation odds ratio association with breast cancer of 1.65. Uh, when we went to our test set, we're actually reasonably happy that it's about the same. It's a little smaller. Um, but uh, it seems to be pretty well um, calibrated, the relative risks. So that was reassuring. Um, now, given that um, polygenic risk score, um, we could combine that with uh, sort of uh, population-based age-specific incidence rates um, and knowing something about the distribution of the PRS in the population to actually estimate 10-year um, absolute risks for people at different um, polygenic risk score percentiles. So the top here are women who are at the 99th or higher percentile, so very high risk based on this PRS. Um, the median is, uh, I don't know, this blue line here, 40 to 60 percent. Um, and then you have the people who are at very, very low risk. So this um, threshold here uh, that I've picked out, um, Right. So the threshold is the 10-year um, absolute risk to a 50-year-old, to an average 50-year-old woman. I think I've got that right. Um, which is, you know, numerous guidelines suggest that this is the time when you should start screening. So absent, like if you don't have a strong family history, uh, otherwise you're just sort of like an average risk woman, um, then starting mammography at age 50 coming back every two years is a pretty common recommendation. So that risk risk to a 50 year old woman is, is right about here at this red line. So what this is suggesting is that if you knew your PRS, um, it's actually gonna push a lot of women above that threshold, suggesting they might start screening earlier than age 50. And conversely, there's gonna be some women who are gonna be pushed below that threshold, which is just, you know what, maybe you can wait, you know? I mean, there are potential costs and costs in terms of additional risks uh, from breast cancer screening, including sweating, getting a false positive mammography, um, getting a biopsy, those risks was getting a biopsy. You can be even diagnosed with breast cancer, but it's a breast cancer that wouldn't have been aggressive, aggressive enough to, to, um, to need treatment if you hadn't been screened, right? So there are costs that come with, uh, with screening. So this is suggesting that there are some women who might actually be able to avoid some of those costs. Um, and I'll come back to, to that sort of calculus uh, in a little bit. Okay, so you may have been thinking, uh, I, that's a very simple model that you just sketched out, this polygenic risk score. You're just adding things up. So I know world, the world is complicated, everything interacts, right? It's, it's the, we have a holistic view of systems biology. The why is just adding things up, why does that work? Um, and I, there's a, I think there's a, theoretical, like a mathematical, statistical, theoretical reason for why that works pretty well, even though it's absolutely true that biology is complicated and everything is talking with each other, working together to make us up into who we are. Um, so uh, there's, there's, there's a sort of theoretical reason for that. And then just practically every, almost every time I've seen somebody try really hard to improve model fit by including nonlinear terms, um, that doesn't really work all that great. <laughs> so on some level, this, this linear model, whether you're regressing body mass index on the sum of SNPs or the log hazard of breast cancer on a sum of SNPs, it seems to work pretty well. Um, but it's worth noting that this log additive model, when you're talking about a binary trait, you're talking about log additive on the odds ratio scale, log additive on the relative risk scale, log additive on the hazard ratio scale. It has implications for extrapolated risks in the tail. 
Um, so this is trying to uh, illustrate that. Um, so the black line here is an exponential model. It's another way of saying log linear. Um, uh, so you can see this nice curve. Here's your absolute risk of disease. You know, it starts to spike up as you get out into the tail. Um, and I'm comparing that to an additive risk difference. So if instead of the log relative risk going up by some increment every time your PRS moves a little bit, if your actual risk moved up by a little bit additively, um, this is what that additive model looks like, the linear model, that's the gray thing. So wh which of those two models is, is real or a better fit to the data has huge implications for people who are out at the tail. Um, and one of the challenges we face actually is that most people are over here in the middle of the risk distribution. So the way I've plotted this out, we're sort of focusing here over on this 1% over at the far right of the risk distribution, whereas most people are actually here or off the plot. Um, and in this range, it's actually really hard to tell the difference between an exponential and a linear model. So when we're trying to empirically you know, assess how good is this model fit, um, most of our goodness of fit tests are really saying, well, it's a pretty good fit because most people are over here. What we really care about is what's happening in the tail um, clinically. Um, and we can talk about it later, but the only way I've been able to figure out how to get at that is to amass really, amass really large sample sizes so we have enough people way out here, and then we can actually ask, okay, how does this work in the tail? Um, and to, this, to the extent that we've been able to do that, I think it's still early days. We still have a lot of work to do here um, because it's these, these tails that are important and getting large sample sizes out there is, is just take work. Um, but what we've seen so far is that actually the exponential model is a better fit than the linear model. This is an early example of that. Um, so where you can see the uh, model predictions under, now I'm calling it multiplicative, but this is the log additive model. Um, so those are the model, the black dots are the predictions under the multiplicative model. The gray dots are the predictions under the risk difference, additive risk difference model. Um, so you can see as you get under the tail, those two models are very different. And then the dots with the error bars, that's the empirical fit for people in each of those risk bins. Um, and if you look at this, it looks like the multiplicative model is a, is a better fit than the additive model. Uh, and that was borne out, um, uh, this famous paper that sort of put polygenic risk score on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, so Kara et al. in Nature Genetics, they looked at four complex uh, diseases. Uh, and they plotted the polygenic risk score percentiles versus um, the prevalence in the UK biobank. And it has this sort of exponential S shape that you would, you, you would, you would expect under a log linear hazard uh, uh, model. Okay, um, so how do we go about validating these? We train them. We have some evidence that we think they're going to actually um, uh, work well in a new population. How do we actually show that? Um, and here I'm going to sort of go from, and th there's, I'm going to skip over the, the sort of easy thing. It's not that easy, but um, uh, you, you have to do it, uh, which is basically say, I trained a PRS in this, in this, using this study population, and now I'm just going to see, is it associated in my new sample? Um, so frankly, most of the time that's like shooting fish in a barrel, it's going to be associated if you've done things well in the, at the training stage. The question is not just is it associated, but is it associated in the way I thought it would be? And specifically, if I have a way of linking the polygenic risk score to an absolute risk of disease, does that absolute risk line up with what we actually see? So this is, this is calibration. Um, so your actual risk should equal the predicted risk. So if I plug in my polygenic risk score and my risk model says your 10-year risk of breast cancer is 10%, well, of, uh, of 10,000 women who have that predicted risk, 1,000 of them should get breast cancer, right? So the assessing calibration is super important because we're going to need to know that when we're assessing benefit to risk, to benefit to risk ratios in terms of deciding interventions. So, um, you know, at some level, um, calibration is, should be reasonably straightforward. Like if we could enroll 10,000 or 100,000 women uh, and follow them for 10 years, um, then you can sort of see how your prediction lines up with what actually happens. 
of course, enrolling 100,000 women and waiting 10 years uh, is, is a challenge. Um, uh, so we want to make use of data that are around now. Um, so challenge number one is we typically don't have large cohorts with long-term follow-up to estimate absolute risks. Um, um, and uh, right, so that seems to be basically challenge number two seems to be the same thing. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of ways around that. Um, one is to, um, I see, I know what I was getting at, sorry. Um, so even here, in terms of estimating, coming up with that model for predicted risks, um, again, that would be easy to do if you had a cohort. You could sort of say, people in my PRS bins, here's their risk at each of those bins. Um, but we don't, for cancers anyway, we don't have large enough cohorts to actually come up with those prediction models. Um, so that's challenge one. And then challenge two is if you want to validate that prediction model, we still would need another really large cohort. We still don't have them. Um, so the solution that a lot of people have adopted to challenge one is to take relative risks, odds ratios from case control data, combine them with population-based incidence rates and the distribution of the polygenic risk score in the population to come up with a model that says, here's your 10-year risk of, given your PRS, here's your 10-year risk of breast cancer. It's sort of interesting to say, given your PRS, your odds ratio is 1.4, but what we would really like to be able to say is your 10-year risk of breast cancer is 3%. So that's the solution to problem one. And for problem two, in terms of validation, validating and calibrating, um, we can actually use case control data that's been nested in a cohort where we know the sampling fractions to estimate the underlying incidence rates by PRS bin. Um, so I'm going to walk through a quick example where we've done that for breast cancer. Um, uh, so this is work by Amber Wilcox and a cast of hundreds. Um, uh, that's kicking around in review right now. Um, so basically we took <clears throat> two models um, linking questionnaire risk factors to breast cancer risk, um, a model linking just PRS to breast cancer risk, and a model that combined both PRS and questionnaire risk factors. Um, we, for each of these models, for each person in our validation data set in our cohorts, we could come up with a predicted five-year risk based on your questionnaire data or your PRS. Um, and then we actually asked, you know, in these nested case control data sets, um, how, do, how, do, how does this perform? So this is the kind of thing that you can look at. So here we're just looking, uh, the x-axis is the expected five-year absolute risk in decile bins based on these different risk models. So here's just the classical risk factors. Here's your polygenic risk score. And here's your um, combined model. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and uh, I guess there's two things uh, to take home from this. Um, the first is we're seeing more or less what we kind of want to see, which is these points lining up along the y equals x line. Um, there's a little bit of deviation maybe here, especially out at the tail, here again at the tail. Um, but for the most part, they line up pretty well. And this actually, this combined model looks really nice. Um, the second is, you can sort of see, judge the informativeness of each of these models by looking at the spread of risk across the different deciles. So combining both the classical risk factors and PRS gives you sort of the biggest spread of predicted risk. Um, and that's lining up well with the observed, which is what we want to see. Um, and then this is just to highlight that um, <clears throat> we did this in like 15 different cohorts. Um, and you actually end up with um, the calibration looking more or less good. Certainly, you know, the slope is pretty nice. Um, but the intercept is often sort of off. You can see that here in this study where the intercept is all the, ex the expected numbers are more, much lower than, than the observed in this particular cohort. And I think that highlights an important point, which is that calibration is context and time specific. I think it's super important to do these kinds of analyses because we want to make sure that if we're saying your five-year five -year risk of breast cancer is X, that that's a reasonably good estimate. But it's also good to remember that 
this is very context and time specific, and there's a little, there's more than a little bit of uncertainty around that. Um, and uh, it's it's hard to be super precise and super confident in that. Um, what's nice is that the discrimination is generally constant. Constant. So if you just sort of rank people in terms of high versus low risk, that ranking is pretty darn good from, from data set to data set. Um, but it's the calibration that can vary quite a bit um, uh, uh, around uh, uh, from study to study. So some are overestimating a little bit, some are underestimating a little bit. And that can have a lot to do with sort of um, cohort effects. Like some of these are older studies. Um, so the women that are uh, 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 participating, um, you know, uh, were born in the 40s and 50s. Some of these are much more recent, and the women were born in the 70s and 80s, right? So that might be playing into a role. Okay. Um, so that was calibration, and now I want to come to this important point um, that I mentioned before about calibrating uh, validation across ancestries. Um, so many of you may be, may be familiar with this paper um, uh, that came out uh, last year uh, that highlights the fact that polygenic risk scores that are trained in one population often perform less well uh, in other populations. So it, concretely what that means is polygenic risk scores that were trained in European ancestry populations, because that's where the vast majority of GWAS have been done so far, um, don't generalize well to non-European ancestry populations, um, Latinx folks, uh, African Americans, Africans, um, East Asians. Um, and why is that? Um, partly it's because the marker that you end up choosing to include in your polygenic risk score may depend on which um, ancestry you did the initial GWAS in, uh, and the effect size estimates may be different from from population to population. Um, so this is an example of why uh, LD differences can erode uh, performance. So this is from uh, a nice paper from the PAGE consortium that looked at um, uh, differences in genetic associations across different ethnicities. Um, so here you have an example of, uh, you know, maybe at this locus, this RS1180992 is the true causal um, variant. Um, if you run your meat grinder in a European ancestry population, it might pick RS1298274 as the, the SNP is going to include in the model as the proxy for this region, um, which is great. Like these things are super highly correlated. So in a European ancestry, who cares? Population, who cares? It's going to work just fine. The challenge is if you go to another population, Hispanics and Latinos, well, the correlation between the selected SNP and the true causal SNP is a little worse. And if you go to an African-American population, it's actually pretty bad. Um, so this is one of the reasons, um, it's sort of my default assumption for why these, these, these models start to tank when you move to different populations, is that this LD pattern is, can be very different across different ancestral populations. So proxies that work well in one population are not going to work well in another. Um, and in terms of having, um, in terms of what that means in terms of polygenic risk prediction, um, so here is this is predictive accuracy for continuous traits, um, uh, quantitative traits. Um, so relative to European ancestry folks, um, it, you can see that the predictive accuracy in African ancestry samples is as much as 75% lower in African samples as opposed to European. So this is again for models trained in European ancestries populations and then applied in, in other ethnicities. So this is super important to keep in, keep in mind. Um, you can see a similar thing here, um, the per standard deviation polygenic risk change in coronary artery disease. So this is for a binary trait. Um, so here are, um, uh, the, the, in the UK biobank, um, the yeah, British white samples. Um, European ancestry, um, so you get a, a hazard ratio of about 1.7, let's call it. Uh, when you look at uh, folks with African ancestry, um, now you have a, a, a hazard ratio of about 1.25. So clear degradation in, in performance in terms of risk discrimination. Um, so things to keep in mind. Um, so what I just met, mentioned is that the um, 
these PRS perform best in European ancestry individuals at the moment. The goal, and everybody's working really hard on this, is to improve to make larger, get our get larger sample sizes in non-European ancestry populations, so that we can build models that are relevant to those populations. Um, uh, but even while we're waiting for that, um, I think it's important not to sort of throw the baby out with the kind of dirty bathwater, um, <clears throat> because even though the discriminatory power in non-European ancestry populations may be lower, it still doesn't mean they're not clinically useful. Um, so here's an example um, for 10-year uh, risk of heart disease. Um, this dashed line is the sort of the threshold for should you be on a statin or not. Um, here I'm looking at the 10-year risk of heart disease or stroke for a healthy, otherwise healthy 50-year-old man. Um, the, in terms of the hazard ratio or comparing the risk at the 90th percentile to the risk at the, I think I said 10th percentile, sorry, my screen is, my little win video window is blocking that. Yes, 10th percentile. Um, so that gradient is much larger in European ancestry men because that's, that's the population where the PRS was trained, um, strikingly so, right? Uh, but now, if you look and see what percentage of men are above this clinically actionable threshold, actually, it doesn't matter what your PRS is for European estrogen folks, you're not crossing that threshold. Like you're young enough that your risk is low enough. You're young enough, you're, not, you're, you're healthy, good BMI, you're not a smoker, blah, blah, blah. I don't care what your PRS is, you're at low risk. Whereas for African-Americans, <clears throat> uh, it suggests that um, you know even though you're healthy, Body mass index is good. Um, uh, based on your PRS, um, you may be crossing this threshold. So maybe you should consider taking a statin. Let's talk about that. Um, so, and this is, uh, these are like three papers that just came out that I think sort of highlight this, um, but in our, actually in a broader context. Um, so this sort of hints at that, uh, which is it's not just that polygenic risk scores developed in European ancestry populations uh, don't generalize well. Um, it's sort of risk scores in general developed in European ancestry populations don't generalize well um, for a bunch of reasons, but two of the biggest are age specific incidence rates can be very different, both in terms of magnitude and shape, uh, and the distribution of risk factors, even if the relative risks are the same, if the distribution of risk factors are different, that's going to change uh, the, the, the risk model and how it performs. Um, so this is just an example from uh, that last paper um, that where we took uh, risk models not involving genetic data, just typical questionnaire risk factor models that were developed in European ancestry populations and then asked how well do they work in um, Korean populations. Um, this I'm just showing as a plot of the age specific 10-year um, risk in a Korean population. Uh, to highlight the difference between this and what you would expect to see in a European ancestry population. First, generally the risks are lower. Second, they're skewed much younger. You're getting this real, real peak early on um, that's higher than you would see, relatively higher than in European ancestry people. And then you get this drop, which is totally not what you see in European ancestry populations. So the shape of this distribution is totally different um, than it is in European ancestry women. So if you just take that, those underlying incidence rates and apply them in a Korean population, you're, you're gonna be wrong. Uh, and of course, it's exactly what we saw, especially for women who are older than 50. So exactly where you're getting these very differences, these very large differences in incidence rates. Um, so you could actually improve the risk model um, in a Korean population by swapping out um, the, European ancestry incidence rates for Korean incidence rates and the European distribution of risk factors for Korean distribution of risk factors, because those can be very different too. Smoking prevalence is very different um, in Korea than the United States. Um, so by accounting for that, you could actually improve the model very well, even if you kept the relative risks the same, um, uh, use them from a European ancestry population, sort of knowing they're wrong. Um, they're actually still, that model is still actually not so bad. Of course, the best thing to do would be to fit those in a Korean population as well. Okay, so now we have a model um, 
we are happy with the fact that it's strongly associated with our outcome. There's a nice risk gradient. Um, maybe it identifies some people who at high risk who we think they might be, maybe, you know, maybe that's something we would where we'd actually change clinical decisions. Uh, we've calibrated it. We know that our estimates are actually reasonably good um, and that they work, they generalize well. So the, now, now the question is, okay, should we be using this in clinical practice? Um, and um, uh, you know, I, I sort of want to emphasize the usual epi answer to most questions, which is it depends. So it really depends on the clinical context. What's the disease? What's the what's like? What's the planned intervention? Is it screening? Is it giving people take telling them to take tamoxifen? Is it uh, prophylactic mastectomy? Uh, is it taking a statin? Like so, what? And then what are the risks associated with either not treating, not intervening versus the intervention? So all those things are going to be very specific to a given context, and those are all those sort of things that we have to sort of balance when evaluating whether or not doing some sort of risk, strat risk stratified strategy makes sense. I'm going to just walk through um, an example of where we've we, we've tried to do this. Um, uh, so this is work with uh, uh, your own vendor Brock. Um, this is, this is a PhD dissertation. Um, where we did micro simulation modeling to, to see whether a polygenic risk stratified breast scanning breast, breast cancer screening program made sense. Um, so this is just sort of in background on the micro simulation model. Um, so you know ideally maybe we would do a really large randomized clinical trial where some people uh, are going to this risk stratified uh, arm and some people go into standard of care and then 30 years later we figure out okay, which, which group actually had fewer breast cancers and had fewer deaths due to breast cancer. Um, more power to you if, you if you can get that to happen. Um, but if we're sort of jonesing for an answer now, um, or at least a, you know, a sort of idea of whether it's worth investing in that, what can we do now? We can do a micro simulation model. Um, so we basically simulate a huge cohort of women under different scenarios. Um, and then we evaluate how well with these different screen programs do. do. Um, so underlying all this is a model for the natural history of breast cancer. How fast does it grow? When, you know, when does it initiate? How fast does it grow subclinically? What's the probability that it's going to get picked up um, without mammography? What's the probability that it would get picked up with mammography? Um, so we, we model all that and then we sort of ask, you know, in a population where we didn't do anything, how many breast cancers would we see? How many deaths? In a population where we did sort of the usual screening strategy, start at age 50, come back every two years, how many breast cancers? Or if we did some sort of stratified strategy based on your PRS, how does that work? So this is that sort of plain vanilla strategy. Everybody comes in at age 50, you come back every two years versus maybe I we stratify folks according to their risk. So if your genetic relative risk is above five, um, then you're gonna come back, you're gonna start at age 30 and come back every year. Um, uh, uh, whereas you're between three and five, start at age 30, come back every other year, um, and so on, all the way down to if you had less than a relative risk, less than a half, um, so you're actually sort of at a lower risk. Well, maybe you can start at age 60 or age 50, but then come back every three years, right? So depending on your age stratum, you, on your risk stratum, you get a, you get a different strategy. Um, and uh, just FYI, I've sort of highlighted the, the width of these arrows sort of reflects how many people are in each of those bins. Um, so, you know, you might think the people at greater than fivefold average risk, um, they're actually, they probably will want to change their screening behavior, um, but it's a small fraction of the population. Um, right. So, and then we compared what would happen under these two strategies. Um, and long story short, um, the stratified strategy, we were able to, um, uh, so this is all relative to no screening at all. So we have more life years gained uh, and we're able to avert more breast cancer deaths. Uh, and what's important to note is that these advantages accrued disproportionately among the high risk groups. So folks who are down here, it sort of doesn't like, in fact, in the middle here, they're exactly the same, that they're, they're getting the same recommendation they would have gotten anyway. So it's really not making a difference for them. Um, but the folks up here at the high end, um, they're getting a real benefit for that. So there's a small percentage of women who may be benefiting from, from the stratified screening strategy. 
Okay. All right. Uh, so one other example of um, uh, the potential clinical utility of polygenic risk score and breast cancer screening is adding polygenic risk score information to sort of standard risk panel screening. Um, so where you're getting information back on not only BRCA1 and BRCA2, but also genes like PALB2, DEC2, RIP1, that kind of stuff. Um, so some of those uh, genes, uh, it's not totally 100% sure what it means to be a carrier of a pathogenic variant. Like you're at higher risk, but is it high enough to warrant MRI straining? Um, it's certainly probably not high enough to warrant prophylactic mastectomy and like you're not at BRCA1 levels. So what do actually we do with that? Um, and the potential hope, hello, is that you could use the polygenic risk score to help provide just basically additional information that would help further stratify women. So here I flagged an action threshold of basically, sorry, of basically twofold um, breast cancer risk. Um, so, which is roughly equal to um, uh, the guidelines for uh, undertaking um, uh, uh, MRI screening uh, as opposed to standard mammography. Uh, so you can see if you're a carrier of BRCA1 or BRCA2, that's the blue and gold lines here. Um, that sort of, again, regardless of your polygenic risk score, you're at, you're at super high risk. Um, we totally recommend that you should be doing aggressive screening. Um, let's talk about you know, your risk management strategy. Um, for folks who are carriers of ATM and CHECK2, however, um, where you are on the PRS spectrum actually says, can say quite a lot about where you are on the risk spectrum. So if you're actually at the lower end of the PRS, um, you're maybe even at sort of like population average risk, even though you're carrying this pathogenic variant in CHECK2, You've, you've been lucky enough to inherit a lot of protective variants across the rest of the genome. Um, so maybe you can avoid uh, intensive screening, whereas there are gonna be folks at the other end of the spectrum who are definitely well past that threshold, who again, we should, we should look seriously at how we're gonna manage your risk. I'm just gonna skip that in the time. Um, okay, so now maybe we've made the decision that, you know, there's enough of, uh, there's, it sort of seems like this could make sense and change how we, uh, we manage folks clinically, how are we actually gonna do this? Um, well, the first thing I wanna emphasize is that in reporting results of studies developing and calibrating polygenic risk scores, we have to have some standards. We have to make sure that these things are reproducible. Um, so there's a, a, a recent um, position paper from uh, ClinGen and uh, the polygenic risk catalog that sort of lies, that outlines sort of these are the things that you have to be reporting. Where did, like what population did you develop this, the, the study in? Um, what was your algorithm? Uh, did you do cross-validation? Did you have an independent test set? Like what do all those steps look like? And then importantly, you have to actually report the darn thing so that somebody else can faithfully reproduce it in a new data set and validate if it actually works. Um, and sort of one of the, a couple of the practical developments that make that a little easier um, are the launch of the PGS catalog. Um, uh, and the Cancer PRS web. Both of these came out in um, the, at the end of 2019. Uh, so you can go there. You can look up the phenotype that you're most interested in, and there will be, um, you know, basically everything you need, hopefully, um, to be able to um, uh, calculate the PRS for samples for people in your study locally. Uh, and a lot of annotation in terms of like where did this, like what is it supposed to, like what was the phenotype actually? Um, how should it like who, who was it developed for? Um, so all that information um, is available at, at these two um, sources. So if you're doing these kinds of things, you're building a PRS for, I don't know, plasma rhubarb level, um, by all means, when you publish, go right to, go right to the PGS catalog and upload your PRS because people are gonna use it and it's gonna increase, increase the visibility and it's just good for science. Um, and then, so that's sort of like on the, study the sort of science end, we want reproducible science. In terms of actually communicating stuff to um, patients and physicians, my guess is how this is going to work is there's going to be some sort of web interface that's going to read in either stuff that you went, like for the questionnaire risk factor data, you type stuff in on some sort of touchpad, um, and then you sort of pull your polygenic risk score, or at least the genetic variants that are in the PRS, 
from uh, uh, a local from the local lab. Um, that all in, the, in some back end somewhere gets turned into a risk, and then what ends up showing up to the clinician and the patient is basically a sort of simple report which says your tenure estimated risk of breast cancer is X, your lifetime risk is Y, this means blah, 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 discuss. Um, so because certainly I don't think anybody wants to sort of get the list of 313 breast cancer SNPs or 2.5 million coronary artery SNPs. Nobody's gonna be able to parse that. Um, uh, you know, we're gonna have to have some sort of way of visualizing this and sort of summarizing it in a useful fashion. Um, so this is, we can talk if, if it comes up in the Q&A about sort of like, how do you actually do this sort of like in terms of the actual physical pipeline. Um, and then there are important things to think about, like, like we're saying, how do you communicate that? Um, even if you're just giving them a number, how do you make sure that it's something they understand? Is there some sort of, uh, uh, you know, there's always concerns about genetic fatalism, like, oh my gosh, it's a, like somehow getting something about my genetics is different than saying, well, you know, you should really cut out smoking. Um, uh, that somehow genetics is sort of destiny. Like, how do you appropriately convey that? Um, again, the whole point of this is that we're telling you something about your risk, but that's totally modifiable through many different ways. Um, okay, so a quick summary. Um, I do think we're at a point where a lot of these polygenic risk scores may be clinically useful, uh, and this is only gonna get better as GWAS sample size increases and the diversity of samples that are going into those GWAS improves. Um, but we're gonna to need to do external validation and calibration to make sure that these things will port well uh, across multiple uh, populations. Uh, again, more work in non-European SSP populations is going to be super important. Transparency and model reporting, also important. And when it comes to thinking about the clinical and public health utility, it's always, it's really, you gotta get down in the weeds and it's super context specific. Um, okay, well, Thank you all for making it through to the end. Um, uh, I really look forward to seeing some of the, hearing some of the questions. Um, I should acknowledge that a lot of this work is, you know, uh, the work of a very large consortium, uh, developing the PRS, calibrating the PRS, doing the modeling. Um, uh, all of this is, uh, is really the, the work of, of hundreds of dedicated investigators and literally hundreds of thousands of, um, of research study participants who've uh, donated their, their time and their biosamples um, uh, and uh, to participate in this research, to which we're super grateful. Okay, so I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much for that excellent talk. So we do have a number of questions, so I'll just go through and start reading these off to you. So. Uh, the first question is actually a three-part question, so I'll just I'll just read you the first part. Okay. <laughs> so once you establish a training data set, how long, like what time frame, could you keep using the same data set for risk predictions on the test data set? Interesting question. Um, so on some level, um, if you if you're in the luxury of having a test data set. You can knock yourself out. Like you can fit hundreds of thousands, millions of models, and at some level, that's sort of what's going on in the background of a lot of these these uh, algorithms. Um, and then, but the point is, you evaluate them in the test data set, and that you can use up. <laughs> so if you if you take your million models and then you rank them all in your test data set, you take the best one. Awesome. If you look at that best one, you know what? That makes me think. What if we tweak the model this way? Then you go back to the test data set, the training data set, um, and then come back to the same test data set and see how well does that do? Now you've cheated because you've used some of that test data set to help build the model. So you would have to have yet another test data set. Um, and that's actually kind of what we did with, um, with, the, with the building the breast cancer PRS is we had our training data set, we had a validation data set where we ranked all the models relative to each other, and then we had one, like, or actually two, like totally pristine, locked in a box, test data sets that we didn't look at until we had our final model. And then we just asked, how well does this model do? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, mean, I think one of the reasons why our model performed a little less well in that final set of test data sets than in the validation data sets 
was because there was still some model fitting and training going on in the validation set. Like we were using that information to pick which one was best. Uh, and what we thought, how good we thought we were in that data set, it turns out it wasn't quite that good, but it was still darn good. Thank you. And, and so then uh, the second part of that, so as new predictors evolve, do you update your existing tra training data set? <clears throat> Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. In fact, we're, we're, we're sort of in the middle of doing that now. Um, so the, um, you know, the, the models that we've been um, evaluating um, up till about a year ago involved uh, sort of well-established clinical questionnaire-based risk factors and um, the polygenic risk score. Um, but that's leaving out a super important predictor for breast cancer, which is mammographic density. Um, so basically, PRS, mammographic density, those are the two biggest contributors to your future risk. Um, so right now, our models don't include that at all. So we're actually going back. Some of that training data that we had, we're getting data on mammography, adding it to that. Um, and then we're going to go through the whole sort of model fitting process again. Um, so on some level, well, and I should also note, we're actually doing a bigger GWAS. So we're doubling the, the size of the, the biggest cancer GWAS. So we'll have more samples to, um, to, to develop that model. It's fully anticipated that we'll end up with even more SNPs in our polygenic score than we have now. Um, it'll do better. Um, so the challenge there is not sort of reusing the same data for training. Uh, I, I think the challenge is again going to be, where do we get sort of a new test data set um, to evaluate um, this new model that has these additional features. Uh, and I guess, again, for us, part of the luxury is because we're doing this, we're doubling the size of the, the breast cancer GWAS, we're going to have um, a, a decent number of new samples that nobody's analyzed before that we'll be able to set aside and use as a test data set. You know, I have to say that's really, it is a luxury um, because sadly, um, breast cancer is one of the, is the most common cancer in women after skin cancer. Um, uh, so we can enroll very large cohorts. Um, we can do like super big end studies. For less common cancers, it gets difficult. And then you have to start to get clever and do things like this uh, cross validation or bootstrapping or some other analytic technique to sort of approximate what you would do if you had a really large sample size. Okay. And then how, how often do you go through that process of, of updating the training data set? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, I, you know, I would say often enough, but not too often. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to pun a little bit. I'm going to do the epi, epi question and say it depends. Um, so clearly, you know, I think one of the things we saw when we did this calibration exercise was there are secular trends. Like the, the model that was developed using data mostly from the early 2000s didn't really work well in the 80s and may not work well in the 2020s, right? So there are changes in how these things perform because there's changes in the underlying population. There's, you know, if God forbid, if diet is anything in your model, like what we're eating has totally changed, even if your answer on the food frequency questionnaire is exactly the same. Um, so there will be, you, you will have to update these things. Um, uh, but exactly how often, it's gonna be partly a question of feasibility and sort of what's the shelf life. Um, and that's going to be very context specific. Um, so I know I've heard of um, some sort of clinical decision making model models that are developed using EHR data, um, where they're they're like sort of, sort of rolling development. Like every six months, they like you know they 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 have a new set of training data and they set aside a new set of test data and they go through the whole damn process again. So they're constantly updating their their model. Um, because what people prescribe and how and how things are coded, all that's changing all the time. Well, and, and then, uh, so given the large sample sizes that you're ideally working with, are you able to get all the required information or all the polygenic risk factors for every patient? That is an excellent question. Um, and the answer is no. <laughs> so ideally you'd want polygenic risk score, detailed, questionnaire, risk factor information using the same damn questionnaire. Um, uh, the mammography using the same like 
at least the same technology, never mind the same machine, right? Like you want all that on the same on the same group of people. In the real world, you don't get that. Um, so one of the things that um, that we've been thinking about is sort of how can you make best use of it? So there are going to be some data sets where that's exactly what you have, um, but it's going to be 10% of your data. There's like a really nice cohort study where they collected all that at baseline and, you know, that's awesome. Like you actually know what the correlation between density and PRS and agent menarche and density, you know all that, and you can use that when you're developing and validating your model. Um, but you only know it for that part of the data set. There's going to be other folks where all you have is the polygenic risk score. Like they never bothered to ask anybody about the questionnaire data. There's going to be other folks where you have the PRS and the questionnaire, but not the mammography, right? So basically, um, we've been thinking hard about how do you sort of deal with this sort of missing by design issue. Um, so um, uh, right. So the the hope is to use the those data sets where you've measured multiple. Uh, risk factors or data types um, to estimate the correlation patterns among those and use that to help um, sort of fine tune the estimates from studies where all you have is the PRS. So you're sort of doing what you would do, sort of a multivariable analysis that you would do if you had data on everybody, but you don't. Um, long story short, it's a, it's a form of imputation. Okay, thank you. And, and then do you see high similarity in polygenic risk factor across ancestry, but not much similarity in classical risk factors? Yeah, no, so I think the, the, I think the polygenic risk scores, so if you're thinking like in terms of relative risks, the relative risk gradient described by polygenic risk scores developed in European ancestry populations definitely have this issue when once you go outside of European ancestry folks, they start to perform less well. Um, and if we were in a world where we developed all our polygenic risk scores in Africa, well, I shouldn't say that. If we developed them all in African populations, we'd probably be, be better off <laughs> because there's more genetic diversity in Africa. Um, um, but, uh, but in principle, it's like once you develop in one population and you go to another, you start to run into issues largely because of these differences in correlation patterns among variants. Um, so that's a known known. For the risk factors, um, so they're, they're, I, I, can't, I can't say carte blanche across the board. Um, the, many of the risk factors are actually quite similar, uh, at least for breast cancer. Um, it's also, frankly, TBD. Um, so that was Part of the backstory with the with our, the free and rice modeling project was um, the data set that we had anyway for evaluating the association between risk factors and breast cancer was relatively small. It was a few hundred cases, right? So whereas the, you have these really big European ancestry meta, meta like meta analyses for agent metarchy and smoking and body mass index, so you can get a really tight, precise estimate of those relative risks. Um, whereas in the Korean data set, we could estimate, so like we'd have an unbiased estimator of what's going on in Korea, but it'd be super noisy. So the question was, could you actually, actually do, even though the European ancestry estimate is not quite right what you should be using, because it's so precise, is it actually doing better in a Korean ancestry population? Um, and again, small sample size, end of one study. Um, but that seemed to be like the least important thing. Okay. Like getting that at uh, the age specific relative, the age specific incidents right, and getting the distribution of risk factors right um, was were super important in terms of getting your absolute risk estimation to perform well. And the relative risk distribution really didn't seem to make much of a difference whether you're using the European ancestry estimate or the Korean estimate. We did see a couple of differences um, between for specific risk factors. Um, uh, you know, most were generally the same in the same magnitude ballpark. Uh, and the, but the differences we saw, they were like they tend to be rare with really large confidence intervals, or things where, oh, you know, the way we asked about it in our study was quite different than the way they asked about it over there. So I don't know if that's an actual biological risk difference or it's just the way we asked about it. I, ho yeah. I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah. No, and so then, um, could you overcome the ancestry difference effect by? adding samples from that different ancestry to your training data set and updating that? 
or yep. do these samples have to be evaluated as a completely independent data set? Yeah, well, that's, I think, one of the big open questions right now. Um, so, and as many of you may be aware, the NH NHGRI has put out a call to develop uh, polygenic, polygenic risk score study sites where they're just basically building as large of a sample as they can that's as diverse as possible um, so that they can build polygenic risk scores using a bunch of different strategies. So either if I'm building a model for African-Americans, I'm just going to train in African-Americans. How does that do? Uh, or, well, I've got, I've got 50,000 African-Americans and over here I have 500,000 Europeans. By combining them, I'm actually helping or do the Europeans swamp the African-Americans? Or is there some clever way of averaging those that I come with a better estimate? I think those are all open questions. Um, and the answers are, they're empirical and we're gonna find them out. Um, so, you know, I think on some of them, I suppose you're now, now, like today, if we had to do this today, I think some sort of weighted average um, combining as much data as we can um, and not overtraining to, uh, if you're interested in African-Americans, not overtraining to a European ancestry population, but using that information somehow. Um, I, I think that's probably the best strategy right now. Um, uh, but that's totally limited by the available data. Like hopefully once we have more data, we'll be able to do more and have a better feel about what the best approach is. Okay, great, thank you. And then one of the attendees wants to know your insights on extending using patient demographic and sequencing data in conjunction with digital imaging data to improve PRS by validating orthogonal to conventional risk factors such as age, smoking, et cetera. Okay. Um, so, you know, if, if, if I think I understood the, the question, uh, please jump in if, if I'm not answering. Um, so, the short, the, the, the quick answer is I think it's super important to do that. <laughs> And uh, short, and in fact, we have a big grant to do exactly that. So th this whole spiel about integrating when you ha you don't have all the same data on types on the same people, that's exactly what we're thinking about doing now in like a really large sample of folks um, for breast cancer. Um, and we're answering exactly that question. How much do the, on top of the risk factor information, how much does the mammography matter on top of those two, how much does PRS matter, et cetera. Um, early days, um, you know, again, if I had to make, if I had to say something now, based on what we, the data we have now, um, I think those are all independent contributors to risk. Um, really, like su almost surprisingly so. So again, we know some of the SNPs that are associated with breast cancer risk are also associated with mammographic density. Mm -hmm. So you think, well, maybe some of that breast cancer germline stuff is mediated through density, or it's mediated through hormonal exposures like uh, age at menarche or menopause. Um, so when I put those things in my model, the SNPs aren't that interesting or they're less interesting. And actually that, that doesn't, really doesn't seem to be the case. The, the, all those independent effects, they don't change all that much once everything else is in the model. Um, so which, if you're interested in risk modeling and describing the, the, uh, as big a risk rate as you can, that's actually really good news. Wonderful. And, and so then uh, one more question. So given the different lifestyle and environmental factors, for different ancestry, would you recommend combining the polygenic risk factors from the general population to ancestry specific classical risk factors to develop the PRS? Yeah, and no, I, think, I think that sort of goes back to what we were just saying a second ago is um, we, we don't know yet what the best approach is. Um, um, so, uh, I mean, clearly you need to be, if, if, when you're developing a polygenic risk score, you have to pay attention to variation in that population. Uh, so the more you get and the more you can include, the better. Um, the question is, so like I alluded to, even if you just take something that was totally developed in European ancestry folks, and it's not doing super great, but it's giving you some information, maybe, you know, maybe it's useful. Um, again, the hope is in three years, five years, 10 years, we'll be able to know a lot more about what works uh, for everybody. Um, uh, so we won't have to, we won't have to uh, make do with that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So it looks like we made it through our questions.
questions. Um, that was a really excellent talk. Oh, and people are saying thank you. So no. hey, you're, you're <laughs> thank welcome. Thank you. That was really fabulous. I wish I could have seen you all. Um, so, but uh, I know how these webinars work. You can always do that. So, thank you so much for taking your time to be here today. So um, it was my pleasure. I'm glad it worked out. Yeah. Okay, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. And uh, our next talk will be uh, Friday on June 12th. And Dr. Sean Davis from the National Cancer Institute will talk about cloud computing and uh, collaborative big data science.